Thank you, Catherine. What a beautiful way to start this morning. And so wonderful to have everyone just bustling at the beginning of the service. No one wanted to take their seats, which was lovely. It's so great to have the building full. We have some guests in our midst this morning. If you are a Harmony Mountain singer, would you raise your hand? Come on, don't be shy. Look, they're all sitting together. They're scared, hey? No, I'm just kidding. We're so glad you're here this morning. Harmony Mountain is singing with our own Vox Illumina this morning, and it's been beautiful before the service just to hear this, this um, building illuminate with even more joy and music than usual. So we welcome everyone this morning. There may be some other new people here. Maybe you're checking us out. My microphone's making noise. Let's try and fix that. Um, if you are new here, we're just delighted that you're here. We're the North Shore Unitarian Community. And if you enjoy today, come again. We have some fun Christmas services coming up. So we hope you'll all join. For now, let's all stand in an opening gathering song called Gather Here. And we'll sing it through once together, and then we'll break into parts and sing it as a round. lovely singing everyone. You Harmony peeps can keep coming. Welcome this morning to the North Shore Unitarian community. We gather here on Sunday mornings to inspire each other, to empower each other, to live with greater depth, meaning, and purpose. We belong to a faith organization called the Unitarian Universalists. We have a set of eight principles that kind of guide our beloved community, and we do not have to think alike to love alike. If that's an expression that's new to you, I'll just share it again. We do not have to think alike to love alike. We welcome independent-minded people of good heart. And whether you have a belief in a higher power, whether you have multiple names for some sort of deity, whether you have a sense but no name, or you have no belief at all, you are welcome here. Whether you come today in all your glory and goodness, or it's a bad day and you feel like you're failing, here you are, as you are, you are welcome here. We welcome those who see life as a paradox, with a lot of and and not a lot of or. We embrace those who are willing to walk this tightrope of life, because that's what it is, that's what it feels like most of the time, and we want those who will reach out to help others walk it too. Whether the tightrope of today feels like a grand adventure, or the most miserable nightmare. We gather to support each other as we strive towards more truth, equity, love, and compassion in the world, in this crazy, broken world. Here we are people who feel our interconnection with all of existence, and we try, we try to let that be our guide as we take each footstep on the earth. And we recognize that we are walking on the traditional and unceded territories of the Coast Salish people, and we are all striving towards a better, higher, more ethical way of living on this earth with, with all its natural beauty and all its people. And we do this work of beloved community together with joy, with kindness, 
with laughter, with music, with inspiration. No dogma, no damnation. Lots of imperfection, a lot of small F forgiveness, and a whole lot of fun. You are here. You are welcome. We start our time together every week with the lighting of the chalice. Catherine's going to light our candles this morning. We say some words together that mark the start of our service. We kindle this flame as a symbol of our gathering. May the light of understanding illuminate our darkness. May the warmth of sharing bring us peace. We light two other candles this week in our weekly ritual. The first is for joys and sorrows. And this week, we don't know of a lot of personal sorrows in our congregation, but we have some joys. We have the joy that, that Karen and Brian Funt are back with us after a number of weeks off sick, so it's really lovely to see your faces again, Brian and Karen. We have the joy that Marcia and Jim's granddaughter is through her heart surgery and is at home being a rambunctious little child as ever, and we're so delighted that felt like a long time coming. And we have joy to know that Jean, and Stuart, um, Jean Prescott and Stuart Browning are doing their art sale that they do every year. And we all know we held um, Jean in our hearts this spring because she really struggled with a physical illness. And it's just delight that they're back doing their usual thing, selling their beautiful art. So three great joys to share this morning. Undoubtedly, there are a few sorrows that are sitting um, sad in our own hearts that will remain unspoken, but we light this first candle in honor of all the joys and sorrows in our world this morning. And lastly, our candle of global concern. It becomes harder and harder to find words to speak to the atrocities of this world. As we inch towards more violence, less peace, less care of children and humans everywhere, I just ask that we close our eyes for about 30 seconds and in whatever way feels right to you, send a shining light in the world, hold them in light, say a prayer, whatever feels right to hold these issues of global concern. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. So it's quite an honor for me to be up here assisting with Catherine's service today. Unexpected gifts is just such a lovely topic. I'm sure there are stories we could all share about that topic. I had fun thinking through some memories of people and situations that have given me unexpected gifts in my life. And that I'm, these gifts of knowledge or wisdom or time, or kindness or generosity, so many stories that I think have shaped me into the human being that I am. And I think that's what you're going to speak to us today about, Catherine, those gifts that you have received in your career of both healthcare and music therapy. I, too, work in healthcare, so it's been fun having some of those conversations as we plan for today. And I, I have this deep appreciation that these days a lot of healthcare happens in teams, and I'm very grateful for that. I realize how much a gift it is to do the work in healthcare in teams these days. That's different than years ago. And it's fun, actually, to work with people, to come to know them, and then to do the seemingly difficult work of healthcare, but doing it in a team makes it lighter, better, um, and more humbling, maybe. And there are many small things we can do to help a team grow, and as the team grows, it's amazing how the team gives back to me and to all the members of the team. So I'm grateful for the gift of teamwork. But for these three months right now, some of you know I'm doing a very different type of work. I'm doing kind of some learning. I'm in a mentored role. And I'm in a situation where I'm in a very different work environment. In fact, multiple work environments. Sometimes I work with different people every single day. Some people that I may never see again. And I've found that incredibly difficult. I guess I shouldn't be surprised that it's hard, but I vastly underestimated how much that would unsettle me as a human being. Like, I'm generally a reasonably steady on her feet person most of the time. But I found this experience of being in different workplaces and working with, frankly, strangers much of the time incredibly distressing. And it's taken me a little bit of time to realize, duh, I don't know why, but it has. It's taken me some time to realize it's not just because I don't know them, but it's because they don't know me. I'm a complete stranger. And I'm not myself. 
I'm not at my best, especially when I can't build a bit of a relationship. I can't have them get to know me, and then we grow this synergy of relationship, which then allows us to turn and do the sometimes difficult work. And we can usually do that better with a team cohesion. So it's been an unexpected gift, as I reframed this, an unexpected gift to be reminded that like all humans, I too, at this stage and age of my life, need, have this deep need to be seen, to be heard, and to be understood. I think we actually all have that. We pretend we don't, but we all have that need. And I've been so struck by how people have gone out of their way to be kind. It was my second day in this big multi-floor tower of a workplace and I arrived. I'd been there the day before, but I couldn't remember where the bathroom or the change room was. And I don't know anyone and I walk in and all the faces are different. So I asked this woman in the hallway. I think it turned out she was part of the cleaning staff. I didn't know. And when I asked her, she didn't just give me directions. She smiled. She took me by the arm. She walked two and a half minutes out of her way to walk me to the change room door. She didn't leave me there. She pushed in the door code, which I had forgotten and would have had to fish out of my phone. And then she opened the door, walked me in, and said, I'll show you the back part. I think that's the best place to get changed. <laughs> like above and beyond, so kind. The staff member that showed me three times how to make the same entry on the computer system, like it's all new computer system, and she showed me three times, I just couldn't remember. And she did it with no judgment, no impatience, just a smile and a gentle, it's okay, so kind. And my best example, it was Friday afternoon, I was working with a small group, we went to deal with a situation, something that normally I would be the leader of. But I'm in a learner role, so I'm behind, I'm in like second row seats. And uh, I watched the leader manage the situation, I contributed a few small things that I knew were maybe helpful, maybe superfluous. The situation resolved itself and our part of the team left, and we debriefed a little in the hallway, I asked two questions. We had a short conversation, the whole thing probably less than 10 minutes. And then we carried on with the rest of our tasks separately. At the end of the day, the team came together, we said a few brief words, and we went home, Friday, 6 p.m. This team that I spent kind of a little bit of time with over three days, and most of them, I, I really think I'll never see them again. So Saturday morning, I'm sitting having coffee, being very grateful I'm not at work. I'm sitting having coffee, and a text comes up on my phone. <coughs> It's a message from that leader. It shared a couple reflections from our brief conversation the day before, and it ended with, thank you for working with me this week. I hope it was as helpful for you as it was for me. We need more thoughtful humans like you in this work. He had no need to send that text, and I'll likely never see him again, but it was just pure kindness and he had no idea how helpful it was to me. Every day, there are so many opportunities, so many small moments where we could help build people up. A three-line text, actually walking someone to where they need to go instead of giving them confusing directions, holding the door open for someone behind us with a smile, being extra patient with someone who's clearly struggling with English or struggling with an aging brain, or struggling with an emotional overwhelm in the moment. Buying a coffee for someone. Like, we all know this, but I personally am coming through 12 weeks of being reminded every single day just how important those little gifts, those little moments are, both to receive, but to give. We can never know the impact we have on each other's lives. And we are all such complicated, fragile beings living in a messy, complicated, complex world a world where these days it's hard to know what's actually true or real. But kindness, those acts of kindness just because, they are very real, and you know it, it's palpable. And it's so needed. Kathy's now gonna come up and sing a beautiful song called My Grateful Heart. And the last two lines are, I gather my blessings like the gifts that they are, and I place them quite gently in my grateful heart. And those words have really resonated with me these last few weeks. Mm -hmm. 
a day in December, the sun on my face, the middle of ocean, one quiet place, center of strangers, a meeting of souls, an embrace that is treasured wherever I go. When I struggle and shadow, there are voices that come, whisper so low, oh, you know your fortune at one. And I gather my blessings from the light and the dark. Welcome them into my grateful heart. The blue of the moonlight, the heavens contain the madness of music helps keep me sane. Core of confusion, a small flame that glows. There then to guide me wherever I go, sliding the spirit, my feelings go numb, then it comes like a kiss, remember this, your fortune one, then I gather my Sings from the light and the dark. Welcome them into my grateful heart. A day that's remembered, small sacred space, walking toward balance, praying for grace. We gather my blessings like the gifts that they are. Place them gently in my grateful heart. Place them quite gently in my grateful heart. My grateful My grateful heart, my grateful heart. Thank you, Kathy. What is your life's blueprint? As I was planning for this service, I spent time reflecting on the moments in my life when someone or something, an experience, a teacher, a movie, a book, something became a touch point that caused me to look at life through a different lens. I asked myself, were there shifts in perspective or unexpected gifts that came from those touch points? 
Experiences, moments we encounter throughout our lives can have a significant influence in the unfolding of one's unique life journey. Some are serendipitous, opening us to new possibilities or paths to explore. Others can be difficult, difficult losses or tragic events that often have a lasting impact. I have had my own share of personal struggles, loss, and suffering through which I believe I have gained a much greater self-awareness, empathy, and wisdom. It has been my experience that unexpected gifts can arise even from such difficult times. Today, however, I am choosing to reflect more on pivotal moments, chance encounters, opportunities that have come along in my life moments that have changed my way of thinking, resulting in me taking a new path or making a different choice. Martin Luther King once spoke to a group of high school students at graduation, asking them, what is your life's blueprint? Whenever a building is constructed, he said, there is usually an architect involved who draws a blueprint, and that blueprint serves as a template. King went on to draw an analogy between that and building the structure of one's life. He stressed the importance of developing a sound blueprint in advance as a guide for life. Well, you know, I confess, I think I missed that memo. <laughs> I was on autopilot for much of my early life as I think most of us were. The closest thing to a blueprint I had was simply what my parents were teaching me. Brush your teeth, make your bed, watch your manners, study hard, practice your music, wear clean underwear. <laughs> and then, of course, in those days, it was simply assumed that I would go to university and of course, as a female child, there was also an expectation I would get married, stay home, raise children. As my dear daughter Maureen used to say about unspoken parental expectations, Mom, they're just in the ether. <laughs> Looking back, the blueprint of my life at that stage of my youth was not of my choosing, but rather what my well-intentioned, loving parents were choosing for me. So if that was my blueprint, well, it was definitely in need of some revision. After completing my degree in nursing, I worked in rehabilitation medicine for several years. I did get married to a lovely man. We were blessed with three wonderful children. One of my early pivotal moments came when I discovered I was pregnant with my third child. A surprise at the time as I was preparing to enter a Bachelor of Music program at UBC. And so I put those plans on hold, a bit reluctantly I admit, and stayed home for another five years. My youngest son, Scott, was an absolute blessing and in a way, a mentor for me. I remember him at the age of 12, questioning my somewhat prescriptive view of how to set the table, when and how to cut the lawn, how to tie a tie, and even how often to shower. <laughs> Are there rules, Mum? Are they written in the sky? Did I miss them? <laughs> My Scott, now 40 years old, married and a father of two, teaches philosophy, philosophy to grade 12 students. <laughs> How fitting. My pet moniker for him remains, he is my idea man. He is an old soul who embraces different ways of thinking, although I still believe one should shower regularly. <laughs> when all three children were in school full time, I revisited my plan to return to school and in the process stumbled across a relatively new degree program in music therapy offered at Capilano University. One of, Liz, uh, one of my instructors was the lovely Liz Moffat over there. This music therapy program was 10 minutes, just 10 minutes away from my home. So rather than traveling all the way out to UBC every day, this felt like something I could manage. Despite initial reservations about the practicality and even the merit of such a career choice, 
my heart said yes. And so the study and practice of music therapy turned out to be one of those unexpected gifts. I began to understand and experience music and the power of music at a whole different level, at a much deeper level. And for me, the ensuing opportunities to apply this new awareness and skill, that set me on a whole new path. A quick aside, my mother once said during my tumultuous years when I dreamed of pursuing a career in music theater, Catherine, you can't make your living as a musician, be a nurse. My very British mother was a proponent of Noel Coward's advice in his song, don't put your daughter on the stage, Mrs. Worthington. You should remember that, Sonia. <laughs> My first job after graduation from CAP was with the BC Cancer Agency working alongside social workers and medical staff, helping patients and families find their best ways to manage the pain, suffering and emotional challenges that accompany a cancer diagnosis. This new role in healthcare using music and healing imagery felt like a combination of my two seemingly dichotomous trainings. Accompanying fellow human beings on their journey with such a frightening and painful disease was a profound experience for me. I was privileged to work alongside a skilled clinical hypnotherapist who ran the very popular relaxation groups at the agency. I learned to listen deeply to people's stories. I discovered my ability to offer care, comfort and hope to help lessen suffering and fear of mortality, not just through music, but also by my very presence. I was awed and humbled by the strength and resilience of the human experience I was witnessing every day. I was blessed and inspired by this gift. I remember in particular one fellow who came often to the relaxation group he had had a recurrence of his cancer and had been told that he only had a few months left to live. Every day when he came in and was asked how he was doing, he would smile at everyone and say, well, I got up this morning, I'm still breathing, life is good. Or the woman who was dealing with her third round of terribly debilitating chemotherapy arriving to the group one morning after the first winter snow. When asked how she was doing, she recounted her experience of waking in the early hours of the morning after a restless sleep, making her way downstairs. Outside the window, she saw the maple sapling that she and her husband had planted just a few months before to celebrate her last remission. The weight of the snow had caused it to bend over such that the tip was touching the ground. At that moment, that poor little tree seemed to her to be a metaphor of how she was feeling. She sat down at the kitchen table, put her head in her hands, and started to weep. Awakened by the sound, her son came running downstairs. Mom, Mom, what's the matter? She pointed to the little tree and said, I feel like that tree. I just can't do this anymore. I'm so tired, I have nothing left. But mom, he said, look. And he ran outside and shook the tree so the snow fell off the leaves and the tree bounced back. At that moment, she said, I felt a surge of hope flow through me. I was able to sit up. I was ready for another day. I worked at the cancer agency for 12 years. I loved doing that work. During that time, I enrolled in and completed a postgraduate degree, a decision which entailed risk for me. In my head, I was saying, too expensive, too time consuming. Was I smart enough? Was I too old? And yet, taking that risk led to an unexpected opportunity to move on to become head of the counseling department at Canuck Place Children's Hospice. 
I worked at Canuck Place for 10 years. It was also luminous, very rewarding work that felt more like a calling than a job to me. The children and families I met during that time remain in my heart to this day, especially one dear little seven-year-old girl struggling with a terminal genetic disease. She often shared her daily mantra for life with me from her wheelchair. Well, you just need to live and love it up. <laughs> I think the moral beauty that Bruce was referring to last week lived in that child and in that remarkable hospice house of compassion and care. And I too was on the receiving end of that gift. After that, I worked at Vancouver Hospice for another eight years as a clinical counselor. One of the unanticipated gifts in my time there was an opportunity to take a leading role in the introduction and acceptance of medical assistance in dying protocols on site in hospice care. My own personal experience caring for my father as he was dying informed my understanding of the profound importance of dignity and choice at end of life. Life is full of moments that matter, moments of clarity, truth, beauty, connection, moments that signify turning points. We can choose to pay attention to these moments or not. I was very moved by Bruce Grierson's reflection last week on the importance of noticing, valuing, treasuring moments of beauty in the world around us. Music, especially singing, has always been that for me. My career in choral conducting was one that just gradually emerged over the years, sort of on the side. Perhaps it was presaged by a small shower gift I received from a friend at the age of 22, just before I got married. I brought it here. This little figurine has had a special place in my home ever since. As I mentioned earlier, after my marriage, I worked as a nurse in Ottawa for several years before I became a full-time mum. As part of my community involvement, I started a little girl's choir called Sugar and Spice. Soon thereafter, I was invited to take on conducting a local adult choir, the Goulburn Jubilee Singers, since their director was retiring. Despite years of vocal training and choral experience, I had never directed a choir before. So this opportunity was yet another gift. I found the experience of encouraging people to make their own music through singing an incredibly heartwarming endeavor. Their joy inspired, nourished, and delighted me, and continues to do so. Some years later, when we moved west, I went church shopping, and in 1986, found this North Shore Unitarian Church. At the time, there was no choir or music program here. Within a few months, a fellow congregant approached me saying, you can, you can sing. Maybe you could start a choir here. <laughs> and that was the beginning of a joy-filled 14-year stint as music director for this spiritual community. I retired from the position in 2004, as by that time I was working full-time in healthcare. Allison Nixon took over the position, and we've been so lucky to have her here ever since. But for me, other persistent, serendipitous conducting opportunities kept turning up. In 2006, I took over directing Vancouver's Universal Gospel Choir. I did that for six years, and then the Sound Eclectic Jazz Ensemble for another seven years. Along with that, I was hired by the Health Arts Society to develop and conduct the Helena Choir, which was a pilot program for people with early dementia. I remember one of the women who participated in that group 
She touched my heart when she came up to me after rehearsal one day and said, you have given me my life back. All of these conducting opportunities were true gifts for me. They changed my life. My blueprint was evolving. After my 70th birthday and then two years of COVID, I decided to retire. You know, I really had no further plans to take on another job or another choir. But when Harmony Mountain Singers knocked on my door in the fall of 2022, looking for a new artistic director, it seemed as though the universe was telling me something. This is something you should do. This is something you need. Don't let it go. And it was only minutes from my door where they rehearsed. Several members of Harmony Mountain Singers are here with us this morning, as you know, um, to help sing the anthem, Sing the World Better. I love that title. I heard this wonderful piece premiered at a choral conference last July in Newfoundland. I loved it so much that I requested the score from the arranger and then included this gift as the finale for our own winter concert. Wait for it. It's entitled Sing the World Better. <laughs> coming up next weekend. I'd encourage you to buy tickets, but we're sold out now, um, which is great news. I believe the most significant moments of personal growth tend to come when one is ready and willing to be open, honest, present in the moment, vulnerable, attentive in the world, and then how one responds to these moments. That becomes part of one's unfolding blueprint. In my life, as I have shared with you, I have taken a few risks, trusted my instincts, chosen paths less followed. One can all, not always predict where those paths will lead. Six years ago, I made the very difficult choice to leave a marriage of 45 years. It was not an easy decision. However, it had become, it had become increasingly clear to me that my heart was missing something, something profound and exquisite that I recognized and found in the woman I have chosen to spend the rest of my life with. Carol is a soulmate for me. She also happens to be here this morning singing with the choir. And so my life's blueprint continues to unfold. It will always be in penultimate form. So far it has been shaped not only by my choices and my many blessings, but also by some painful losses and events. Hard times can leave us with a bitter taste, and yet it is often said they can also make us stronger and sometimes be the catalyst or the precursor to unexpected gifts. May it be so. I'm going to invite you now to sit a little more comfortably in your seats and enter into a, a kind of meditation. Closing your eyes, if you choose to. Becoming aware of your breath. Just taking an easy breath in and then letting it out, perhaps planting your feet on the floor, feeling grounded and supported where you're sitting. Just take a moment to consider the unexpected moments, the people, the opportunities, maybe the difficult things that have come into your life that perhaps from that has come something unanticipated, something that led you down a different path, a fork in the road, something that was a gift.
taking time to sense the blessing that perhaps came from that gift for you. Taking time to appreciate that the world sometimes works in mysterious ways. And then slowly bringing yourself back to this room here and now, opening your eyes and rejoining us here. As we move towards offering you this anthem, sing the world better.
that was awesome. <laughs> Every week in our service, we take up a collection that supports a community organization aligning with our values. This month, our outreach recipient is Food Stash. It's an amazing little organization in Vancouver that recovers 130 pounds of, sorry, 130,000 pounds of food each month, food that would otherwise have gone to waste. Then it sorts them and delivers them to charities and over 100 households every month. This year, just this year, they have rescued 1.2 million pounds of food. That's, that's just incredible. I mean, as we know, one-third to one-half of all food produced in Canada goes to waste. That's an incredible source of um, unnecessary greenhouse gases. So Food Stash merits our support. We hope you'll give as generously as you're able. You can use an envelope uh, you'll find in the seat back, or also on the screen you'll notice a QR code for um, credit card giving and also a text to do an e-transfer. Thank you for your kind support. Thank you, Catherine, for playing while the offering is collected by our ushers. Thank you, everyone, for your generosity. <coughs> we have a few announcements. The first one, the most important one, is that everyone is welcome to come down after the service for some sandwiches, sandwich lunch, which has been kindly arranged by Diane Hicks. We usually can smell the cheese melting, actually, on a sandwich day. I don't think we've noticed it this morning, but um, the suggested donation is $5, but regardless whether you have the $5 or not, everyone is welcome to come partake in community and sandwiches. Um, next, our community is creating 25 Christmas food hampers for the Lookout um, Housing and Health sorry, Lookout Housing and Health Society shelter folks, but we're actually going to give the hampers to folks who are living in transitional housing. So between now and December 22nd, please bring non-perishable food items and put them in the bins that are in the front foyer under the table. Coffee, tea, pasta, tin soups, anything, and um, Lane Duval is kindly arranging to collate them into packages and we'll have them delivered before Christmas. Next week's service, being done by Bruce Grierson, is titled, Attention is the Soul of Devotion. You have to think about that for a second. Attention is the Soul of Devotion. It'll be a contemplative gathering. I think it was Annie Dillard that said, how we spend our days is, of course, how we spend our lives. So thank you, Bruce, for another wonderful service next week. 
If you're getting a sense that our services are quite different, it's very true. There's a common phrase around here, you need to come to at least three or maybe six services to get a sense of how things are done. So feel free to come back for another one if you're new. Um, there's a reminder from our board about the ongoing stewardship campaign. Please complete your pledge, ideally by the end of November, and that allows your board to create a budget for next year. Lastly, an ask from Diane about the Christmas dinner. If you are thinking of joining the Christmas dinner on December 14th, but you haven't bought a ticket yet, um, there are lots of spaces left and they're hovering around, do we have enough to actually continue on with the event? So if you haven't bought your ticket and you'd like to, please do so, because that will influence whether we postpone that event or not. Any other announcements in the community? I was gonna announce about your concert, but apparently there's no tickets left, so <laughs> scratch that one. Um, that's wonderful. Please rise as you're able and we will sing our song, Our Heart is in a Holy Place, Hymn 1008. For any of our folks who've been in the community a long time, you will remember we used to sing this as when our heart is in a holy place. But that's not very you, you. That's kind of like conditional love. So it's just, our heart is in a holy place. <laughs> beautiful. We are blessed with love and amazing grace. Our heart is in a holy place. Just because, just because you are, no conditions, no dogma, no standard, you are just blessed. We all are with love and amazing grace. We just get so must, messed up about it in this crazy broken world of ours. Amen to that. Amen in its original translation meaning so be it. Whatever words have sacred meaning for you, to bless the thoughts and the feelings and take them in your heart and carry them with you in your day and your week. Amen. Amin. Shalom. Blessed be. Let it be so. 
Let us close our service together. We extinguish this flame, but carry with us the light of hope and the word of hope. The world calls us to live with depth, meaning, and purpose. We go forth with courage and love. Thank you, Catherine, for beautiful words and stories this morning. You're an inspiring leader and a humble human being, and we are grateful to have you in our midst. Thank you, Harmony Mountain singers, for bravely joining us this morning. North Shore Unitarian, what? (laughs) We're so glad you were here, and we shared your joyful exuberance, and we hope you'll come again. Please do. Thank you, Allison and Vox Lumina, as ever, for your beautiful music and your uplifting spirit. And thank you to everyone for being here this morning, gathered in the home of the North Shore Unitarians. Oh, how we all need community in this crazy, broken world that we are living in. When our voices come together, we can sing the world better. When our voices, our hearts, our minds, our hands, our feet, when we gather together, we can make the world better. We can do much more than any one lone individual can do, no matter how much power or how much money that person has. Remember the wise words from Margaret Wheatley, never underestimate the power of a small group of committed people to change the world, because in fact, it's the only thing that ever has. Please rise together one last time. Let's grab hands and sing the world better one more time this morning with the closing song, Circle Round. (laughs) 